Hey again, welcome back to Daily Dose of Anime Recaps. In this video, we'll be covering the animated movie titled Gantz O. In the initial scene, we witness Tokyo being overrun by huge swaths of intergalactic monsters. Meanwhile, a black suited girl named Reika is running about with her tail tucked in between her legs. Why run in such a hurry, you ask? Well, thing is, a horrific red skinned monster with multiple horns on its head is on Reika's heels currently. The big fellow soon attempts to squash the lovely woman by flinging a vehicle towards her. Thankfully, Reika's captain named Kay rushes over in time to rescue his pretty teammate from the gruesome fate of becoming a meat patty. Later on, Kay displays a ton of bravado by charging headfirst towards the enemy, all while realizing that the odds of his victory are slim at best. Thankfully, his efforts yield good results, since the fearsome monster's head is successfully blown apart after receiving multiple gunshots. Sadly enough, Kay himself is left on the verge of death after having been flung around like a rag doll previously, an act that resulted in dozens of broken bones, etc. That said, this heroic dude soon gives in to his critical injuries and thus breathes his last. Meanwhile, the loss of her beloved and sure-footed captain leaves Reika traumatized. Later on, despite her unwillingness, the girl is soon teleported back to the real world since the battle here is over already. The scene then switches to a teenager with slick black hair named Masaru, who's currently busy making his way through a subway station. Just then, some lunatic serial killer dude pulls out a knife and stabs some poor old fellow heavily in the chest. Such a sudden act of violence causes a panic outburst among the citizens, all of whom scurry away instantly. Meanwhile, despite being super scared and having beads of sweat rolling down his forehead, our sage-like protagonist still rushes over to save the old victim. Alas, Masaru soon pays a dear price for being so impulsive and is left to die alone after getting stabbed as well. Multiple times, no less. Strangely enough, the previously dead Masaru soon awakens in an enclosed room inhabited by several other folk as well. One of those people, who's actually an old man named Suzuki, starts elaborating the situation in detail to the newcomer. Turns out all the people in this space have witnessed death previously, same in the way Masaru did a while ago. However, what's astonishing is how, instead of having to become ghosts, each of them got teleported to this eerie room with no way out. Just then, the black-colored giant metallic ball in the room's center starts playing some sort of creepy music to catch the audience's attention. Said ball is commonly referred to as Gantz and is the one in charge here. Anyways, Gantz soon backs Suzuki's words by claiming how each member present has indeed died one way or another previously. Later on, Gantz somehow miraculously revived them all and therefore, by default, became the owner of their second lives. Furthermore, all members present, including Masaru, are to follow Gantz's wishes by participating in an endless survival game. Within the game, Masaru and the others' task is to eliminate all alien intruders in sight, especially Final Boss. To that end, Gantz even provides them all with some sort of techie armor to help boost their various physical parameters, including both defense and offense, etc. The group also receives laser weapons as the primary source of launching attacks against the enemy. Just then, the other newcomer starts fussing about how this entire survival game stuff is nothing but a joke, and a lame one at that. That said, the brawny dude even starts acting aggressively towards the others. Having become fed up with the newcomer's non-stop wailing, one of the experienced folk, named Nishi, simply blasts apart the annoying dude's head into smithereens. The arrogant Nishi then also points his gun at Masaru, threatening to kill him in case he's proven to be a burden. The teleportation finishes just then, and soon Masaru, as well as the rest, find themselves in the streets of the city Osaka. Masaru is soon creeped out, once an undead zombie starts making her way towards them all. Thankfully, the arrogant Nishi isn't all talk as he soon proves his worth by killing the intruder with a clean strike. However, soon after a large number of other zombie-like monsters appear as well, including a giant rolling head. Instead of offering a helping hand, the previously mighty Nishi slips away like a scaredy cat. Meanwhile, both Suzuki and Reika are given a heckload of trouble at the hands of those monsters. Masaru attempts to rescue them both, but the poor fellow instead ends up getting squashed by the giant head zombie. Thankfully, the ultra-advanced armor saves Masaru from having all his bones turned into powder, resulting in instant death. Just then, another, much bigger team of black-suited players arrives. The newcomers all appear as fairly experienced and even possess decent weaponry. Compared to them, Masaru and his teammates can't help but appear as beggars. The newcomers realize this as well and start mocking Masaru's team for merely consisting of a harmless beauty, a couple teenagers, and finally, a frail old 
man. Anyways, Masaru and his teammates choose to spectate for a while by simply leaving it up to the newcomers to clean the area and exterminate all monsters in the vicinity. Regrettably, a couple members from the second team are slain under the claws of a snake monster. George, who's one of the two vice captains of the second team, now makes a move and utilizes his superior gravity-inducing weapon to crush the snake-tailed monster. Witnessing such an extraordinary feat, Masaru questions how there's such a vast difference between the quality of weapons and gear possessed by both teams. Suzuki then pulls the curtain from the truth. The old man claims how each of them is awarded with points according to their performance once the match is over. As for the one who's lucky enough to score 100 points, he's offered a choice between three bonuses. Bonus number one, which is the most popular indeed, is to receive advanced weaponry to help that person later dominate the battlefield. Meanwhile, the second option is to revive a dead teammate. Finally, the last choice is to have all your memories wiped out before returning back to the real world and reuniting with your loved ones there. Nishi, who had apparently gathered 100 points previously as well, now utilizes his exclusive ability to become invisible and go into hiding. The narcissistic dude's agenda is to stay low and preserve his strength until the final boss appears. After all, common sense dictates how the enemy boss must be the strongest, and therefore worth a ton of points. Soon after Nishi's departure, Masaru spots a couple citizens being harassed by a one-eyed monster. As usual, our empathetic protagonist prepares to head over and help the damsels in distress instantly. However, Suzuki grabs Masaru by the arm unexpectedly, wishing for him to stay since fighting foes in their current miserable condition isn't the ideal approach to winning. As expected though, Masaru isn't convinced by Suzuki's logic since, as far as he's concerned, standing by definitely ain't a choice when the lives of innocent people are at stake. Suzuki soon gives up after acknowledging Masaru's determination to commit suicide. As a result, he simply suggests for Masaru to make a call to his younger brother one last time. After all, who knows whether the impulsive dude will truly end up dead afterwards, receiving no chance whatsoever or opportunity to contact his brother again. Masaru does as told and rings his younger brother's cell phone ASAP. The little guy has no idea that his elder brother's life is hanging by a thread and may be lost any time now. Instead, the two merely talk about how Masaru can't return for a while, etc. While chatting, Masaru learns how things aren't as simple as they seem and that whatever happens in the game is taking place in a similar fashion in the outside world as well. The realization makes Masaru worried instantly, and so he strongly suggests his younger brother to stay put for a while and avoid heading outside. Later, with the phone call over, Masaru heads over to where the one-eyed monster is running rampant and smacks the horrible thing straight in the eye. The blow surely does carry a punch, especially when enhanced by the suit and struck at such a sensitive area. Anyhow, up next, Masaru continues to perform various awe-inspiring stunts. This in turn helps him better explore the extent of his abilities when being powered by the suit. Regrettably, the dude is soon captured by the enemy and isn't far from his fate of being chewed to death. Thankfully, a girl belonging to the second team and known by the name Yamasaki comes to the rescue on time and helps Masaru defeat the enemy. As it happens, Yamasaki has been bewildered by Masaru's attempt to save random citizens. Thing is, as far as Yamasaki is concerned, Gans's mysterious game is nothing short of being a cutthroat world. Simply put, it's a place where everybody has to fend for themselves, and nobody really gives a damn about the lives of innocent commoners. While chatting, both run into another couple of human stragglers being harassed by a demonic monster. Yamasaki is of the mind to preserve her strength, and suggests Masaru do the same. As always, the stubborn dude doesn't give a damn about reason, and charges headfirst at the enemy. Regrettably, poor Masaru's laser weapon is crushed by the enemy shortly, leaving him with no choice but to fight barehanded. Some distance away, Yamasaki is busy hesitating over whether she should put her life in harm's way for the sake of a newly met stranger. In the end, though, she admits how, despite being an idiot, Masaru is still kinda cute and therefore sprints over to rescue him, ASAP. Unfortunately, the girl's attack misses the target, leading to her capture soon afterwards. The quick-witted Masaru then outmaneuvers the opponent in order to reach for Yamasaki's weapon. Both of them soon thank the heavens after Masaru's shot hits the mark, resulting in the monster's brain being sliced into pieces. In the battle's aftermath, Yamasaki is utterly won over by Masaru's skill, as well as his kindness and resolve to help others. She later admits how she's single-parenting a three-year-old baby. Hence, not being able to survive is out of the question for her. After all, who else will take care for her cuddly little boy if not for Yamasaki herself? Here, Masaru also admits being in a similar situation, since he 
too has a little brother he can't just abandon and therefore has to return back home ASAP. While gossiping, Masaru learns from Yamasaki how both vice captains of the second team, namely George and Muroya, have succeeded in gathering a hundred points multiple times over. With such attainments, obviously the two possess extremely advanced weaponry and suits, etc. However, what's even more astonishing is that the team's mysterious captain, named Oka, has already won the bonus seven times over. That said, it's quite rare to see Oka strolling around randomly within the game site. Instead, most of the time, this human monster prefers to stay invisible the same as Nishi does. What's funny is how Oka soon makes his debut appearance after being discussed by them both. At present, the dude is busy manipulating a gigantic robot to help him wrestle against a humongous bull-shaped monster. The two continue to clash for a while, throwing mega punches at one another, which basically results in half the city's buildings being toppled over. Anyhow, Oka finally gains the upper hand by evacuating his giant robot in secret to launch a sudden sneak attack on the enemy's head, all while dressed in his mini robotic form, of course. On the flip side, a devilish monster, appearing as if it has arrived straight from hell, now mounts a devastating attack against Masaru's team. Meanwhile, Masaru hits the bullseye yet again and binds the enemy using Yamasaki's rope-throwing weapon. What's astonishing is how the formidable winged opponent breaks free of the binding ropes with minimal effort. Thankfully, both George and Moroya intercept the enemy before Masaru and the rest are strangled to death by it. Later, the audience is left speechless a second time after even George's gravity-inducing weapon fails to leave a scratch on the enemy. Moroya takes over from there, utilizing his gravity gun to hit the enemy a dozen times over. Alas, the invincible red-skinned beast is still able to stand properly despite the heavy bombardment. Meanwhile, the flabbergasted Moroya is soon captured by the enemy and isn't far from being crushed into a pile of blood, meat, and bones. Here, we learn how none of the veterans here achieved their present glory without putting in a ton of sweat and hard work. Same goes for Moroya, who, despite the odds, continues to fight fearlessly. Eventually, the winged devil's head is finally blasted apart, leaving its neck to emit a shower of bloody spray before falling down eventually. Sadly enough, Moroya too gives in to his gruesome injuries and breathes his last breath at the same time. All this while, his so-called teammate, George, had merely been spectating from nearby without bothering to intervene or even raise a finger to help out his friend in need. Anyways, the final boss makes an entrance out of nowhere just then. From the looks of it, the dwarf and seemingly dumb monster won't be posing much of a threat. However, knowing how the final boss being a weakling is something unheard of, George continues to stay on guard while launching a quick assault against the enemy. As expected, the tiny opponent isn't a helpless fish on a chopping board at all. What's funny is how all of George's sword slashes are effortlessly evaded by the opponent, who's akin to being a slippery loach. Heck, even after George finally manages to slice him apart, each of the opponent's multiple body parts regenerates into separate clones of him. Feeling annoyed, George finally makes a grab for the baldy and even succeeds at doing so. However, our poor vice captain isn't able to have the final laugh, though. Instead, the dumb-looking baldy utilizes his unique shape-shifting as well as cloning abilities to create tons of female clones of himself. Said clones instantly become glued together, transforming into a female giant as a result. Meanwhile, poor George is engulfed by the heck load of clones, with his various body parts being spit out a moment later. With both vice captains dead, our protagonist, Masaru, is forced to deal with the creepy female giant on his own. Moments later, though, the previously invisible Nishi launches an out-of-the-blue sneak attack on the enemy, rescuing Masaru in the process as well. It's too early to cheer, though, since the enemy soon re-emerges from his pool of blood in the shape of some bull-type creature. Seeing how things aren't looking too good, Nishi attempts to become invisible and escape in silence. Alas, the enemy senses Nishi's presence, despite him being oblivious to the naked eye, and soon launches an electric shockwave attack that blasts apart the arrogant dude's right arm. Masaru then lifts Nishi on his shoulders and flees from the scene along with his other teammates. Finally, Oka makes his flashy entrance and instantly starts raining the enemy with his laser cannon attacks. What baffles Masaru and the rest is how the cursed beast is still alive despite such a heavy bombardment. With the smoke cleared, Oka and the others learn how the final boss has yet again changed appearances, this time having shapeshifted into a humanoid form. The two ace players from respective sides yet again exchange dozens of blows. Oka finally lifts the stalemate after secretly evacuating his mini-robot to launch a sneak attack, basically the same trick he used to extract
exterminate the bull giant previously. In the end, though, Oka explains how the enemy is still alive despite having his head slashed apart. Oka then makes an abrupt escape, claiming how it's dangerous to mess with the enemy in this condition. Despite the risk, though, the courageous Masaru proceeds forward in order to finish the job and end matters for good. Unfortunately, like Oka said, taking advantage of the boss's current vulnerability is easier said than done. Soon, a sphere-shaped bomb pops out of itself and releases tons of lethal spikes towards Masaru. Here, old man Sasuke finally displays his heroic side by stepping forward to block the spikes from showering upon his younger teammate. Alas, doing so proves to be a near-fatal choice for him. That said, the old man is sure to say his farewell in a while, unless the game ends and Suzuki heals by default, of course. On the flip side, the deathly monster finally regenerates, taking on the shape of a deadly skeleton with multiple spikes across its back. Luckily, the tough guy isn't interested in beating small fries such as Masaru and the rest. Instead, he hurries off after Oka, after finding that guy fun to play with. Masaru isn't willing to sit idle and entrust his fate onto others, though. Instead, he starts devising various strategies to help him better collaborate in defeating this wretched monster. As a result, both Yamasaki and Reika hide away in the surrounding buildings. In such a way, the two plan to put an end to the monster's terror by sniping from afar. Meanwhile, Masaru's job is to serve as bait and distract the enemy long enough for the plan to succeed. Before leaving, both Yamasaki and Masaru make a pinky promise to come out alive and live together for the rest of their lives, back in the real world. Back in the present, the horrific monster finally returns, with the legendary Oka's head in his hands. Unfortunately, both girls haven't had enough time to hide at ideal spots for sniping. Knowing all that, Masaru simply stalls for time by asking the beast why they even fight in the first place. Feeling flattered, the beast starts referring to itself as a god. What's hilarious is how the self-proclaimed god soon has his lights knocked out once Yamasaki's bullet hits the bullseye. The beast isn't willing to go down easy in a peaceful manner, though. Instead, it starts madly launching his divine eye laser attack at the surrounding environment. As a result, nearly half the city is torn apart thanks to the beast's rampage. The girls aren't scared, though, and simply continue to rain down hellish lasers upon the miserable beast. Things go south after Masaru becomes victim to a nearby blast attack and has both his feet destroyed. In the meantime, the skeleton dude starts making his way towards Masaru. After realizing how the hidden rats are likely to pop out for the sake of their injured teammates' safety. As expected, Yamasaki rushes out of her safe spot and charges headfirst at the skeleton boss as a means to protect Masaru. Unfortunately, a single laser attack from the said boss slashes her legs and torso apart. The sight of his beloved woman being killed mercilessly infuriates Masaru to no end. As a result, despite being heavily injured himself, Masaru makes his way to a nearby gravity-inducing weapon and rains down a flurry of attacks at the enemy. Previously, the skeleton dude had already been at its rope's end. Now, it's finally crushed to smithereens for good, thanks to the many persistent attacks by Masaru. The game thus results in Masaru and his teammates' victory, with each of them being teleported back soon enough. As expected, all their bodies return to their original undamaged states as well, without any limbs missing. Furthermore, both the kind-hearted Suzuki as well as the selfish and arrogant Nishi managed to survive as well. The impatient Nishi soon starts prompting Gantz to score them each. As it happens, Masaru managed to bag 100 points at once after killing the final boss. As for the rest, none of their scores are worth mentioning. Later, though, Gantz presents Masaru with three bonus choices. Either he can get his hands on superior weapons, revive a teammate, or return back to the real world after having his memory wiped out. Here, Masaru yet again leaves his teammates speechless by instantly choosing to revive Yamasaki, something that's usually regarded as the least profitable option available. Nishi, of course, starts regarding Masaru as a nutcase for having wasted his precious points on such a lame option. With the game over, the participants are rewarded with a vacation period where they can simply return back to their loved ones in the outside world. Learning that, Masaru soon bids his farewell and leaves instantly afterwards as well. After his departure, Suzuki and Reika surprisingly discuss how it isn't Masaru's first time playing this game. Rather, he used to be a veteran here previously, but eventually had his memories wiped out before being granted with freedom. Suzuki declares how it's best to stay tight-lipped regarding this matter. Otherwise, the do-gooder Masaru surely won't leave before reviving each of his dead teammates.